Good morning, brothers and sisters. I'm glad to be able to stand here and share with you all once again. Before we begin, shall we just quickly start with a prayer before I drag the sermon too long? God, we thank you for getting us, gathering us together online. And God, we ask that you help us to hear from you. Let your words sink into our heart. May we hear from you directly, Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters, this morning, my message is titled, Free to be somebody, bracket, in Christ. Have you heard of the, the phrase sometimes we say, uh, we are nobody and then we are somebody. I don't want to be a nobody, but I want to be somebody. Or Jesus has made us somebody, we used to be nobody. So this nobody and this somebody is an expression that sometimes we use to describe this thing called significance. It's what makes us, this significance thing is what makes us feel good about ourselves. It's what makes us feel proud about ourselves. It's what makes us feel like we have value. I would like to continue by reading a portion of the Bible from Philippians chapter 3. Words from the Apostle Paul. Uh, let's start from the later part of verse 4, where Paul talks about the things that he used to derive his significance from, the things that used to make him feel like he was somebody, and how he has changed now that he had become a Christian. Paul says, if someone else thinks that they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, which is a big thing for the Jewish people of those days, of the people of Israel, the chosen, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, he calls himself. In regard to the law, he is a Pharisee. As for zeal, he persecuted the church. As for righteousness based on the law, faultless. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. I'm going to pause here first and I'm going to dwell on the earlier parts of what I just read. See, when Paul is talking about his pedigree, how he was brought up, the qualifications that he has, the religious qualifications that he has, what he's saying is that these things used to make him proud of himself, his background, which tribe he was born in, his education, because he was educated under the best teachers of the law at that time. He was proud of his efforts to, when he persecuted the church, he felt that he was fighting for God. He felt that he was doing something great for God. It was all in devotion to God. And he felt that he had good character because he said that in terms of righteousness, if you look at the fulfillment of their religious laws, he considered himself faultless. In other words, perfect. In other words, good. Good character. In fact, good might be understating it a little uh, according to what he felt about himself in the past. These things gave him a sense of significance and these things made him feel that he was somebody in the past. When I read this, I think, about, think back about myself. What about us? Are there things in our lives that make us feel proud of ourselves? If I were to ask you, what is something that you feel proud uh, about, about yourself? You don't have to be the best in whatever you do. You don't have to be the most outstanding person. But somehow, uh, you just feel proud that you are this thing or you have this thing or you've gone through that thing. For example, some of us may be very proud of our studies. For some of us who are still studying, those of you who are listening, you might be proud of your results in school. Some of us are proud of our career. Where perhaps in a field, an industry that is very hard to get into. We may have uh, gotten into a company or, or done a job or, or doing a job that is 
uh, that not everybody qualifies for. Or perhaps we are successful entrepreneurs, successful corporate people, successful businessmen. Some of us, we are proud of our abilities, our talents, our skills, our experience. We are proud of the things that we can do with our hands, the things that we can do with our minds. Little things or big things in the eyes of others, whatever it is, they make us feel that we have value. Some of us, we are proud of our experiences. Oh, I've gone through this. Oh, I've given birth to four children, five children, six children. It is an achievement in our eyes. Some of us, we say, oh, wow, do you know about the times that I worked so hard in my career? I didn't sleep much, I saved a lot of money, and we're proud of those days where we proved that we could take care of ourselves. We may be proud of our achievements. Do you know I've gotten this award or that award? I've been recognized for this or that. I'm a datok, datok seri, or whatever other titles there are in our overcrowded titles-based kind of society that we have in Malaysia. Some of us are proud of our character. We say, yeah, even though I have not done much, but I have a good heart. I'm a good person. I help people. I'm kind to others. We are proud of this. Some of us are even proud of our children. We say, wow, look at my, my son, my daughter. They are so wonderful and I've brought them up to be like that. You know, they are very outstanding young people and they make me feel proud to be their parent. Now, all these things, we can be happy about them. But the problem emerges when we allow these things to make us feel that we are somebody. When we allow these things to make us feel significant. In other words, if our identity or our significance, our value is based on these things, then we have a problem. Now, how do we know that these are the things that give us significance? How do we know these are the things that give us our self-esteem that we use to establish our identity? You know, for a long time, I was... Uh, proud of my intelligence. I said to myself, hey, I'm quite smart. I do quite well in school. I'm a quick thinker. Not, uh, I'm not the one who, only one who said that. And sometimes people around me, they would tell me the same. Wow, Danny, you're so smart. And that just adds to how I felt about that quality that I had, that I could think. So I base my self-esteem on that. I felt good about myself because I was a good thinker, because I felt I was intelligent. Later on, I realized that I am uh, not really as intelligent as others. There were many who were more intelligent than me. So I stopped taking pride in my intelligence. I accepted that, okay, maybe this is not something that can give me a lot of value. So I shifted. Okay, so when I started working, then I started to be proud, especially in my third, fourth year after working as a teacher for some time. I realized, hey, I'm not too bad in the classroom. I began to be proud of my teaching skills that I had developed. Uh, I was proud that I was uh, able to engage the children. I was able to come up with good worksheets, good test papers, which is a thing, you know. A uh, skilled teacher produces good exam papers. Unskilled teacher produces poor exam papers. So the exam paper is a good indicator of how skilled you are as a teacher, actually. So, when I was proud of that, then I realized that I was not such a good teacher after all. Or that there were other people who were better than me. There were others around me who started off the same time as me but seemed to get promoted a lot faster. So I realized, hmm, maybe I'm not so good a teacher. Perhaps I'm not so good uh, because I spend so much time on my ministry. Uh, so I stopped feeling good about myself because of my teaching skills. And I start to tell myself, never mind, okay? 
Some people are good at teaching. Some people are good at business. I, I, I'm good at the ministry. Okay, God has a wonderful plan for me. God wants to achieve great things through me in the ministry. So that's why when I quit, and when I share with the congregation that I quit my job and want to go to full-time, I felt, I felt proud of that. I felt that, hey, I'm choosing to follow God. I'm going to do great things for God. That's how I'm going to build my value on, where, on the fact that I am someone great in the kingdom of God. I am a great leader in the kingdom of God. So when I tell, and I remember in the earlier days, uh, during that season, when I, one of the first few times when I preached to the English service, I asked the brothers and sisters, consider what we're doing. Consider where we're putting our efforts. Are they worth it? Do they have eternal value? And when I preach that, I, when I think about myself, then I think, yeah, ah, what I do is very good. It has eternal value. So I was proud of that. It's good, right, to serve God. Sounds like there's nothing wrong with it. But you know, our hearts are deceptive. Without knowing it, I had also built my value, my significance. I felt that I was somebody because of the things that I can do for God in His kingdom because of what I can do in the churches and in the ministry. How do I know this was so? How do I know I built my value on that? Because uh, then my child was born and I had to take care of my child. I had to balance between my family and my work and then the pandemic came. When the pandemic came, a lot of programs had to stop. A lot of things that I used to do, I couldn't do. And it seemed like because we could not send Christina to school, so I always had to share in the duties to take care of the child, the babysitting sitting duties. And when you're babysitting your child, how are you going to do ministry? How are you going to prepare for your preaching? How are you going to do all your PowerPoint? How are you going to call the people? It's, it's, it can be done, but it, there's a lot of challenges with that. And so my ministry came to a halt. Do you remember some time back when I talked about worrying? I, I talked about how I, when I'm doing ministry, I worry about my children, uh, sorry, about my family. And when I'm with my family, I would worry about my ministry. And at that time, I always thought, okay, uh, it's because uh, I... I want to take care of my family, so I worry about them. And I, I want to serve God. It's a desire to really do something for God. And that's why I always um, think, when I'm spending time with my family, am I wasting time? But this lockdown period, this whole, this whole year, it taught me that actually when I was having such thoughts, it was not God's glory that I was concerned about. It was mine. It was my glory that I was concerned about. I wanted to build something for myself. You see, uh, the Tower of Babel in Genesis chapter 11, what was the problem with the act of building that tower? The clue is found in verse 4 when the people said, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens that we may make a name for ourselves. Deep within the hearts of many people, whether in the past or today, is, an, is a desire to make a name for themselves. What does that mean? It's a metaphor for saying, I want to do something that makes me feel that I'm important. I want to do something that makes me feel that I'm significant. This is what it means by for my own glory. This is what I mean when I say I'm trying to build my significance on what I can do for God. 
And I do it. I put in effort in the ministry. I pay the price. Not so that I can honour God. I wanted to. But deep down, a deeper reason is so that I can make a name for myself. Now, even if nobody else thinks that I'm doing well, as long as I look at myself and I think, okay, Danny, you are doing well, then I'm satisfied. This is how I derive my value. So even serving God can actually be a way for us to gain significance. But this is a problem. Because when we try to gain significance based on what we do, it is like Paul gaining significance on what he did in the past. And Paul says that in the end, he considered it all a loss. He considered it garbage. If you were to really think about it, whatever we do, whatever we put our effort in, what is the value? Even for me, if I work so hard to take care of the church, to serve the people, what is the value? Does God need me in the ministry? Does God need my help? Certainly not. I used to tell people the most important thing that God did, the most significant, impressive, urgent, important thing that He did was to settle the problem of sin in the world, in people, to reconcile the people to Himself. How did God do it? God did it all by Himself. Because God looked out and said, Where, who will save? Who will do the work of salvation? There was no one. So his own arm achieved salvation. It was God who did the salvation work himself. Now if God did something as difficult, as impossible as that by himself, you think he needs our efforts? Even to serve him, you think he needs us to preach? You think he needs us to do this or to do that? I don't think so. It goes against the God that I read about in the Bible, the omnipotent God who says, who has given to the Lord that the Lord shall repay him? Which means, who first gives to the Lord? Which means, what does the Lord need from us? If we borrow to the Lord, that means that the Lord needs something from us. But no, the Lord has never needed something from us. And in the same way, He did not need my serving. So when I serve, when I serve at that time, it was so that I can make myself significant. It's, it's a trap. It looks like it's significant, but it's not. A lot of things that we do look like significant, but it's not. For example, uh, years ago, I told this story about how uh, my school had this um, this award that they gave out in the school for teachers that did not take any MC, any sick leave for the year. The No MC Award. And after being in the school for two, three years, I thought to myself, hey, what a good, like, I also want to be known as the teacher who doesn't take MC. It's like, it's like good, right? You feel good about yourself, you know? You feel like, oh, I'm a, like a top class teacher. And after watching my colleagues get it for two to three years, I decided one year that this year, I shall not take any MC. Try my best to stay healthy. And I, it, as long as I am still able to go to school, I will. Even if I feel a bit unwell, I will just try to push myself to go to school. So I did it for that whole year. I worked very hard, did not take a single sick day. Time came, end of the year, when the school gave out uh, the No MC Awards to the teachers during our annual gathering, our annual retreat. And when I got, when they announced my name, I felt so proud of myself. I said, oh, Danny Chen, No MC Award. Well, everybody clapped and I went out and I took the prize. I said, well, yeah, I feel good. 
When I went back to my seat, I looked at what was in my hand. It was an envelope. When I opened it, I saw like, I think, a $50 voucher for NTUC fair price. <laughs> I said to myself, oh, this is what I worked so hard for. A $50 NTUC fair price voucher. The whole year, I didn't get sick. And this is what I got. And yeah, my, my colleagues clapped for me. But so what? What happens after that? Nothing much. That's it. It's vain glory. It's empty. Ecclesiastes tells us that much of what we do is meaningless. In fact, the writer Solomon goes one step further. He says that it is all meaningless. Everything is chasing after the wind. What has been done, what was done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. Today, we do something great. Time pass, enough time passes. People forget about it. He is talking about the impermanence of our efforts, that nothing we do really lasts. So when we take pride in the things that we do, in the things that we have gone through, do they really add value to us? How does God see our achievement? Would God clap and say, well done. You have done such a good job taking no MC this year. Will God say, well done. You drive so well. Well done. You have accumulated so much money for my kingdom. Will God say, well done. You have preached 500 sermons over the past five years. Oh, well done. Will God say that? Will God be impressed with our achievements? There is a reason why Paul says that the righteousness that he had, he based his righteousness on all these things and now he considered it a loss. What does it mean to be righteous before God? To be righteous before God means that when God look at you, God say, good. God say, you are worthy. This is what righteousness means. And Paul was saying that no matter where he was born, no matter how much he was educated, no matter what he thought he had done for God, no matter how much he fulfilled his religious obligations, he is not righteous enough. Yes, it's true. Whatever he could do, he would never be righteous enough. Based on what he do, there will never come a time when God will say, you are good enough. Never. Likewise, the things that we do, the things that I do today, the things that I'm proud of, the things that you're proud of, when God looks at it, God also may not say good, worthy, righteous. He will not. And so I came to see that there's nothing I can do to make myself better. There's nothing I can do to make myself somebody. Over the years, I come to realize that the things that I'm proud of, slowly God take them away and God showing me are they really something to be proud of? Are they really something very great? Okay, you do this. So what? You know, for so many years, I was so proud of my O-level results. Anybody, any chance I get, I say, oh, you know how many A's I got? The older I have, the more I realize that this achievement, right, has a depreciating value. It depreciates more and more year by year. Nobody cares. It doesn't matter. So what if I get how many A's when I was 16? It doesn't matter, right? It doesn't matter to you. It doesn't matter to God. It doesn't matter to me today. But at that time, it was so important to me. For those years, it was so important to me. But a lot of what we do is like that. A lot of what we do has depreciating value. A lot of what we do 
cannot make us somebody, cannot give us value, cannot make us significant. They are just meaningless, futile. For the Bible says in Psalm 14, All have turned away. All have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. And in time, I began to see that I am really a nobody. Nothing I can do to make myself somebody. And I needed to accept that. I needed to accept that I was a nobody and will forever be a nobody. Does it sound depressing when I say that? Does it sound like I'm a depressed person on stage for saying this? And if you're listening up to this point and you are a depressed person and you already feel that what you do is insignificant, please do not stop listening at this point because the message has not yet finished. Because if you stop here, yes, it's depressing knowing that ultimately we are all insignificant creatures. But what does Paul say after he talks about all these achievements of his? He says in verse 7, Whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. What Paul is saying is that since he came to know Jesus, he let go of all these achievements. He no longer built his value and his significance on all these things in the past. He said, I consider them garbage, utterly insignificant, that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God. What Paul is saying is that it is God who makes us significant. It is God who makes us somebody. And I'm not talking about achievements. I'm not saying God will use us mightily because that is not always true. That is not always true. Way back when, when I was a teenager, whenever we sent off teenagers for their further studies, they could not join us anymore. They had to study in KL or Singapore or wherever it is, wherever country. We would gather them in the service. We would pray for them. The most senior leader would pray for them and the prayer invariably will be something along the lines of, may God use you mightily. That was our desire during those days. Everybody here, everybody say, Amen. Yes, we all want to be used by God mightily. But whether God wants to use you mightily, that's God's choice, right? And if God doesn't want to use you mightily, so what? If God wants to use us or me, if God wants me to drive, be a driver for the rest of my days, uh, like a Uber driver for the kingdom of God. Can I not? Would you feel that you lose something? Would you feel that you lose out? If God forever call you to be poor, enough lah, but no luxury. Can I not? If God forever call you to be just entry-level worker, you never rise high to become a manager or this or that, or you operate a business, your business never goes beyond that one shop, that one stall, can or not? 
Does that make you feel like God doesn't love you? Does that make you feel like your value is little? See, how do we know when we build some, our identity, our significance on those things that we are proud of, on those things that we crave? Very simple. Let God take them away and see how you react. If God takes this thing away from you that you're so proud of, and you feel so sad, or you feel so angry, or you feel so lost, that is the thing that you have used to build your identity, to give yourself significance, to make you feel like you are somebody. So, 10 years ago, if you were to tell me, Danny, God wants to make you brain damage next time, I'll be like, hey, don't know. Nah. Don't know. Nah. A lot of things also can do, but don't make me brain damage, can? Poor, never mind, okay. All right, maybe even cannot walk, also never mind, okay. Don't take away my brain because my brain is important to me because I base my identity on my brain. For some of us, it's our business. God, take anything away. Don't take away my business. Don't take away my hands. Uh, you know this, uh, the Marvel uh, movies? You know Doctor Strange? Right? Some of you like to watch the Marvel, right? The Doctor Strange, you know why he depressed or not? He depressed uh, because he lost his hands. Because he is so proud of himself as a surgeon, as a top surgeon. His whole identity is as a surgeon. Surgeon need hands, ma, right? So no hands means no surgeon. No surgeon means nothing to be proud of, means that you are crap. Lah. Means that you are nobody. Lah. So the fellow cannot accept. It's like that. When God takes away something that is part of us, and if we feel so sad about it, that's the thing that we build our identity on. If we feel lost without it, that's the thing that we have built our identity on. And I have to ask again today, is it worth? Can we build our identity on it? Can it really make us significant? I'm struggling to explain it, but the answer is a no. It cannot. It cannot because our life is so short. It cannot because our efforts are so limited. It cannot because God looks at our righteousness. God doesn't look like what we do. And when I really accept that I'm a nobody, when I really came to terms with it and said, yes, God, if you want to make me a nobody for the rest of my life, I'm fine with it. That was the point when I realized that God loved me so much. Do you remember, for some of you who are a bit older, some years ago, uh, Bunfei was on stage and Bunfei was sharing this message. I don't remember much about it, but I remember he used this analogy. He said, it is like we are all cockroaches. God called us to be fruitful and multiply. But it's like we're cockroaches, you know. Does anybody here want cockroaches to be fruitful and multiply? No. <laughs> no. Even one is bad enough. You want to kill them when you see them. They are so dirty and filthy. Anything the cockroach touch, we don't want to touch anymore. But we, and so Bunfei was saying, we are as insignificant, as lousy, as nobody, as a cockroach. But God loves us so much that He wants to be with us. He wants to take care of us and He wants us to be fruitful and multiply. And He wants us to be by His side. And all this whole salvation plan, all this whole dying on the cross, everything is one big round just to bring us back to the starting point, which is God created us and He wants to be with us forever. Yes, this is the ending point of our eternal life to be, to dwell with God and God dwell with us. This is the ultimate uh, destination. And so if we are cockroach, if we are utterly insignificant, utterly depraved, in the hearts of everybody, 
there is darkness. Given the right circumstances, given the right motivation, given the right opportunity, we are all capable of doing something that we should not do. We are all capable of hurting others. We are all capable of doing things that are unimaginably evil. Yes, this is true. I know this is true. If we search all of our hearts, if we look back at our histories, I'm sure we can find at least one incident, something we have done that we feel shame about. Confirm. Confirm. We feel mistakes that we regret. Confirm. And yet, yet God loves us. Yet God loves a people who are incorrigible. I learned that word in primary three. Big word for me then. Incorrigible. English teacher means you will never change. So they tell, so she used that to score some of the children in the class. You are incorrigible. You are incorrigible. You are incorrigible. But that's what we are, right? All of us. We are incorrigible. We will never change. We are not capable of changing by ourselves. We are not capable of being good. And yet, God loves us. We can fail a thousand times and yet God loves us. We can be the most humble, most nondescript, most insignificant person on earth and yet Jesus died for us. You know what the Bible, you know what God told Israel? Since you are precious and honoured in my sight and because I love you, I will give people in exchange for you. Nations in exchange for your life. Jesus did more than that. Jesus didn't give any people. Jesus didn't give any nation. But he gave the most precious thing, himself. God gave the most precious thing, his son, for us. Because we are precious and honoured in his sight. This Jesus must be so special that he loved someone like us. Psalm 8 verse 4 summarizes it for us so well. What is mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. Who are we? What can we do? What good is there in us that you are mindful of us, that you care for us? Only when I accept that I'm incorrigible, only when I accept that I'm nobody good, I'm a nobody, then only did I realize how much God loved me. In other words, the more I see that I'm nobody, the more I realize the depth of God's love for me. And this is why Paul says that knowing Christ has a surpassing worth. It's more valuable than anything that we can do that makes us feel good because there's nothing that we can do that makes us feel good. <laughs> Only for a while. And then after that, we still feel like crap. It is only Jesus who makes us feel that we are somebody. Only because for some reason that I cannot understand, in His eyes, we are precious and honoured. I, 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 it just blows my mind. I cannot understand it. And once I recognise that I did not need to improve myself, I did not need to prove, no, it's not improve, I did not need to prove myself when I realised that. Once I realised that my significance is not built out who I am or what I can do, my significance, I have significance because Jesus thinks I'm significant. That brought a great change in my life. That brought a great change in my outlook. It made me reconsider where I was putting my effort 
It made me stop the things that I was doing just to make myself valuable. It's not wrong to work hard. And God wants us to work hard. But I worked hard in the past so that I may build a name for myself. Even if nobody prays that name, at least I praise that name. At least I can say, Danny, you've done a good job. That's the wrong reason. That is building our significance on ourselves. Instead, because Jesus loved us, therefore, whatever hard work we do now, the correct reason, the correct motivation is the love of Christ compels me. So whatever I do is no longer to get something from God. No longer out of guilt, no longer to earn something, no longer to make a name for myself, but it is because of what God has already given me. I want to end off reading Romans chapter 12 to just praise God for His amazing love. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, neither the powers, neither height, nor death, neither anything else in all creation, and may I add, neither any inadequacy, nor any mediocrity, nor any failure, nor any insignificance shall separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord for loving us so much. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.